wicked annoying. Yeah, this is the second time that I've done this. This is round two. Round one was not committed to film. Here I am again, redoing whatever the fuck I just did. Uh, I guess I'm going to talk about the same things again. I don't really want to, but what else have I got? I pretty much went through everything. So, this is not spontaneous. This is drawing upon my first draft. Ugh. I can't remember how I started. How did I start? How did I start me? Are you there? Are you in there? Are you in the LED? Are you in the LED? Somewhere in there. I think you might be. Tell me, how do I start this video? Right, I'm going to do it backwards, I guess. Uh, I'm going to do it backwards. David Benatar. Who is David Benatar? Let me tell you about David Benatar, author of Better To Have Never Been. And let me give you a little bit of historical context like I did in the first video, which was not recorded. David Benatar became known to me during my first year of university. And uh, what a pleasure it was that year. Uh, I was sad and overweight, more overweight than I am now. I know that I have got the uh, the, the the gut of Kim Jong Il working out. You know, we're, we're we're making it happen here. Construction in progress, men at work. Um, but I used to be bigger, believe it or not. Uh, believe Ripley's, believe it or not, I used to actually be fatter than I am now. And that was during the first and second years of being at university, which of course was a waste of time, but I've said that before. So I'm there, listening to Elliot Smith, crying my eyes out about this, that and the other, rather like I do to this day, although with a little bit more self-harm, and probably a touch more aggrandizement. Look that word up. Uh, I don't know what that word actually means. But it sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds snappy. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm in a mess basically, as I as I usually am, but more of a mess. Uh, eating carbohydrates by the kilo, granola squares and marshmallows, and loaves of bread, and brioche rolls, and Ben and fucking Jerry. Actually, I I believe I had a thing against Ben and Jerry, so you know the bread and all that's fine, but the ice cream is a no go. But I'm large, you know, and I'm sad, and I'm not doing any work, and I'm, you know, in the mist, uh, the midst, the mist as well, also the mist of uh, of this this hazy, sad little stoner existence that I have unfortunately carved out for myself because nobody stopped me, and nobody cared to know what was going on. David Benatar appears. David Benatar, the advocate for antinatalism. David Benatar, who says it is better to have never, never have been, uh, because uh, being is such misery and such suffering and torment beyond compare. Uh, such unmitigated horror, consciousness, existence, the day-to-day -day unhappiness of having an extant body on a material plane knowing that you are fated to die and face the unknown of death uh, chronic pain and all that lardy fucking da it's just not fucking worth it says David Benatar it's just not fucking worth it and he's not saying that you have to kill yourself but it would probably be good if you did um, and uh, what else uh, it would have been even better if your parents had worn a rubber and not conceived. That is truly the 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 piece de resistance. That is the highlight of his Chopinesque symphony of philosophy. Um, it would have been better if you were never conceived. If he was never conceived. If nobody was ever conceived again. David Benatar, who I like to imagine engaging in reluctant intercourse with a girl who loves him for whatever reason I don't understand uh, and it goes a little bit like this and this is this is an extract from my stand-up comedy set which I'm currently in the process of writing uh, I started writing it about 
35 minutes ago. We did we did the dry run. We did the first pass at the David Benatar thing. I just I think it's really funny um, to think of David Pe- Benatar like having sex. The guy who advocates for for no conception of any kind. It's just a funny image to think of him um, reluctantly doing his thing. Uh, with 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 a girl that I have named Matilda in my own mind, Matilda from Cape Town, David Benatar being the professor of philosophy at Cape Town University, Matilda being there, being in love with David Benatar. What a what a trial that must be. David, she says, David, oh David, I love you. David, please come inside of me, David, come inside of me. And let's start a family. I love you and I want to be with you forever. And physically I would like to cement this with procreation and the production of further children to continue existence, David. (laughs) This is what she's saying to him, right? I would like to continue the process of existence, David. Uh, (laughs) I don't care what your philosophical objections to being are. It feels so good, David. Just let go. Meanwhile, David Benatar, he's there. It's like, I don't even like this. I'm not even enjoying this at all. I'm wearing 16 rubbers. I've made sure that you are fitted with an in utero contraceptive device. Two of them, three of them, one for each ovary. Because, of course, South African women have three sets of ovaries, whatever that Whatever that looks like, I don't know. I'm David Benatar. I am a philosophy guy. I I am not a proper scientist. I am not a biologist. I do not understand. Uh, (laughs) But I'm wearing three rubbers, and I know that if I come inside of you, and if by some horrible circumstance, by some weird roll of the dice, all of these rubbers break, and the contraceptives fail, and the chemicals that I force you to ingest every morning against your will to make sure that your womb is forever a barren wasteland. If they fail, and you get pregnant, and we conceive a child together, then you can bet that I will be dragging you to a South African coat hanger abortionist in an alley behind the university, and we will be scraping my seed out of your uteral lining with a windshield wiper like it's a cold winter morning um, because being is suffering being is suffering and and it just I know it feels good but I'm told it feels good but I'll never know because I will not allow myself or yourself or any conceptual children that we can imagine to be put at the risk of further suffering my ethic is unquestionable, and my devotion to philosophy is equally such. Um, and uh, and that, that's David. And in the midst of uh, of my tears and my my wanking and my my horrible ingestion of various foodstuffs, there he comes from Amazon with his book, with a picture of a sunset and a and a, a nice calm beach on the front of it. And the title better to have never been the case for antinatalism why you should never have children or whatever it's titled you know the premise is pretty simple it's a slim volume and i don't know what teleology really means or teleology but i'm sure it's teleologically sound i'm sure it's indefensibly airtight which is why jordan peterson absolutely fucking eviscerated him on some south african radio show which I don't know anything about, but I heard a little bit of it. You know, at what point can we just say, like, maybe nature's right about some things, such as, you know, busting makes you feel good. Like, you know, can we have the humility to at least admit that? Can we at least say that, you know, maybe that's good? Um, so what else? What else has been going on? Well, uh, I went to the gym. And that was, you know, obviously, I'm a guy, so every time I go to the gym, ever, I must tell everyone I know immediately as soon as I make contact with them. Good day, how are you? Good afternoon. Nice to see you. I just went to the gym. Um, would you like a cup of tea? What, welcome to Costa Coffee. What can I get you? I just went to the gym. 
let me tell you about how I just went to the gym. I've been to the gym today. Women don't do this. Uh, I think in all my years of life, which, you know, not insignificantly, we have a number of years on the clock now. Um, I think maybe one woman, one female, which is, you know, what we refer to each other as. I refer to you as male, and you refer to me as female. Although it's the other way around, because I'm actually the guy, but gender studies, so it doesn't matter. Um, well, what was my point? I mean, I don't want to die of a heart attack. And also, I kind of like to stand like this, so that doesn't help my case. Am I out of gas? Am I out of steam? It'll come to me. If I wait. If we wait. If you and me wait together. If we wait together. The thread of whatever the fuck I was talking about might emerge again. This is my strategy for most... This is different now. This is We've diverged from the original draft of the video. I didn't even want to make a second draft. This was never the intent, but here we are. I've been talking into a camera for at least 55 minutes. That's not good. <sighs> We're gonna wait together. We're gonna wait for something to pop into my brain. This would be a really good time to open a can of Rockstar, by the way. Or, uh, make a tea. Prepare a meal. Um, you know, rub one out, maybe. I mean, we all do it. Some of us more than most. It's a problem. We're gonna wait. We're gonna wait for whatever the fuck I was gonna talk about. But we're not gonna do it in silence. I went to the gym, yes, I remember now. I went to the gym and obviously as a guy I must tell you everything about the weights that I have been lifting. I have been toiling in the minds of my own introverted suffering, lifting heavy things. Women don't do this, uh, that was the point I was making. I think maybe once a woman has said, I went to the gym today and it was pretty good and I feel better for it. Every time a guy ever goes to the gym he must tell everybody, he must let you know that he has been down down into the depths of his psyche like Joe Rogan does and has been doing for some time. If you've ever watched an episode of the Joe Rogan Experience, you know that Joe Rogan is the ultimate physicist, the, the philosopher of the body, Joe Rogan. Uh, lifting things, kicking things, hurting people, putting you in chokeholds against your will, uh, running around dewy tracks at dawn, with a spliff in one hand and a bag of psychedelic mushrooms in the other. Joe Rogan, who is here to, uh, to tell you all about Brazilian style jiu-jitsu. Uh, we're losing the thread again. Um, yeah, I went to the gym. Anyway, so uh, Wimbledon was on the TV and, you know, sometimes when you go to the gym, uh, if you go at one o'clock in the morning, sometimes they play horror movies, sometimes they're playing... Castilian detective mystery movies where a guy in a, tra in, a, in a trench coat finds a body in the snow and the sound's off and you get kind of into it as you're like trotting away on the, uh, on the Stepmaster 5000. But today it was Wimbledon. Um, 
and it was, it was you know, I, I'm I'm listening to Israeli psy trance. I, I like to listen to Infected Mushroom. I find that the music is sort of analogous to uh, to a roller coaster with ups and downs and twists and turns and uh, fast bits and slow bits, and it's all like nicely varied. And I, I find I perform better when I listen to to that sort of music. So you know, it gives me a little bit of an edge in the same way that theoretically caffeine does. Theoretically. Um, so, you know, we don't have the sound on for the Wimbledon, but we're watching it soundlessly, or, or with the psychedelic fucking thudding electronic soundtrack that I myself have provided. And it's, it's interesting, because you can see the whole narrative of, like, human existence play out on the faces of these people, like, you know, I was watching this uh, Serbian, this old, older, grizzled Serbian with like a face, like one of those guys with the face, the flinty face that you could fucking strike matches off the face that I myself wish I had. And then there's this fresh-faced uh, Polish guy with a baseball cap and he looks like Bart Simpson, he's like 16 years old, um, and he scores a point. And he wins the set, and he jumps for joy, and the fucking Serbian's there behind him with his hands on his hips. <sighs> Staring. <sighs> Ruining. Psychologically looking at this guy and just letting everybody know that he's not pleased. That he's lost the set, and true to form, next round, you know, he comes in. He smashes the fuck out of this guy, this poor kid. Puts him like 70,000 points behind. Takes his revenge. And it's like some Shakespearean master plan. It's like a fucking game of mousetrap. You know, heartbreak. And, 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 and tragedy and success. And challenge and suffering. All playing out on the human stage. Without any real sort of like human authorship. Just sort of like a raw and fetid example of... Uh, a, a, a human experience concentrated down into a game of tennis, and it was quite interesting to see. It was also quite entertaining reading the subtitles and uh, seeing the banter between the uh, between the guys. You know, in between sets, they're talking about, "Did you know? Did you know that you can tell the age of a shark by the length of its gills?" And the other guys are like, "No, I didn't know that. Tell me more." He's like, yeah, I spoke to a marine biologist in between some of the uh, the tennis. She told me that rather like a redwood tree, if you chop a tree down, you can tell its age by the rings inside of the tree that you look at and you observe and you say, this tree is 27 years old. With a shark, you can tell by the length of its gills. And the guy's like, oh, well, that is very interesting. I had lunch alone in the green room. And then there's just like no subtitles for a little while. That was the end of that conversation. A little bit of improvised banter, like it was silence, radio silence from the broadcasters at that point. I had lunch alone in the green room. Yeah. And then hypothetically, perhaps he said, "Oh yes, what did you have?" And he was like, oh, "I had a cheese and pickle sandwich with a slice of tomato." Yeah, how was that for you? Oh, you know, it was uh, moist. Uh, and then the, the subtitles literally said, I don't know where to go from here. And it, the other guy said, back to the tennis. And uh, I, I thought that was fucking hilarious. They were just, you know, I had lunch alone in the green, tr green room. And I don't know where to go from here. I've, I've... Back to the tennis. You know the tennis. You know the world championship tennis that we're commentating. But of course, Wimbledon's like 5,000 years long, isn't it? It goes on literally for like three weeks, non-stop, day and night or whatever. Maybe not day and night, but I like to imagine that at 3am in the morning, there's like South African Saharan women batting fucking uh, flaming tennis balls at each other from afar. Well, nobody watches because everybody's too drunk on pims. They've all passed out. <sighs> um... You know, I, do, I could say more things about Wimbledon, but frankly, this is the second time I've recorded this video, and I'm done. I'm sick of the sound of my own voice. So, you know, this has been a thing, and maybe I'll do another thing tomorrow, and hopefully it was, uh, hopefully it was a pleasant distraction.
although maybe it wasn't maybe we don't need any more distractions I don't know it's time to end the video so goodbye uh, so long and farewell